Good morning, everybody. This is Thomas Felder. We are here on our Transformation Bible Study, and today we are doing Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. Dear Father, be with us today as we go through your holy word. Open our hearts and our minds that we will be receptive to your Holy Spirit. Hide me behind the cross. In your Holy Son, Yahshua's name, amen, amen, and amen again. So here we are on Revelation chapter 17. And what we are discussing is this end time Babylon. The Bible says in, in Revelation chapter 14 that Babylon is fallen, it's fallen, the great city, because she made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. And the Bible says, and he cried mightily with a strong voice saying, Babylon the great is fallen, is fallen, and it's become the habitation of devils, the hold of every foul spirit, and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird. That's what we're talking about this morning, Babylon. Who is Babylon? And who is this woman in Revelation 17? The Bible says that the unclean and hateful birds are a reference to a counterfeit Holy Spirit that would power the system leading people to believe that they are working with the power of God. Revelation 18.4 says, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. God will not warn his people to come out of Babylon if it were impossible for them to identify Babylon. During the early Christian centuries, Jewish and Christian literature referred to the city of Rome as Babylon. In 1 Peter 5, verse 13, also refers to Rome as Babylon. Peter wrote these words while in Rome at a time when the literal Babylon no longer existed. It says, the church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and do so, and so doeth, Marcus, my son. So this is Peter. He wrote words while in Rome and he's sending it out to somebody named Marcus. So he says, the church that is at Babylon. A, a man by the name of James uh, Cardinal Gibbons, right? He's actually a, a, a cardinal in the, in the Catholic Church. He wrote a book called Faith of Our Fathers, Faith of Our Fathers. And in this book called Faith of Our Fathers, he says, Babylon, from which Peter addresses his first epistle, is understood by learned annotators, Protestant and Catholic alike, to refer to Rome, the word, the word Babylon being symbolic of the corruption then prevailing in the city of the Caesars. Right? So this is James Cardinal Gibbons, Faith of Our Fathers. He says that the word Babylon being symbolic of the corruption then prevailing in the city of the Caesars. Let's start with the word. Revelation chapter 17, verse 1. Revelation 17, verse 1. And it says, And there came one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters. This is the angel talking to John the Revelator. So using prophetic language, it describes a woman who rejects God with her whole being. The woman that rides the beast, this, this beast, as we get to Revelation 17, verses 4 and 5, it says that this woman is arrayed in particular clothes. It's, it's describing how she, how she dresses, what she wears. And it gives you all the identifying features that we will show that are, that are identified with Rome. And in fact, Rome applies the same symbolism of herself. In, in Jeremiah 6, verse 2, it says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. So the Bible considers a, a comely woman or a virgin woman or a woman who's perfect to be his church. Isaiah the prophet extends the symbol of a woman to that of a bride, the pure bride that represents the pure church. We find that in Isaiah 62, verse 5. It says, for as, it, for as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall the sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. 
Hosea describes the union of God and his people this way in Hosea 2, verses 19. Hosea 2, verse 19. And he says, And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercy. Let's go to Revelation 17, 2. And it says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So again, the same symbolism of the woman as a church is employed in the New Testament. We find it in 2 Corinthians 11:2. For I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. In Revelation 19, 7, it says, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb is come and his wife has made herself ready, Revelation 19, 7. So this analogy between women and churches is significant. And when he's talking about a pure church, like the one we talked about in Revelation 12 versus this one in Revelation 17. Revelation 7, 2, 17, 2, this beautiful picture of Christ and his bride, the church, is marred by the image of a church with whom has slept with the kings of the earth and has committed fornication with them. The Roman Catholic Church is the only church on earth that fulfills these identifiers of the woman called Babylon in Revelation 17. The description of Babylon is given in the book of Revelation clearly identifies Babylon as the church of Rome. Because the Church of Rome's deviations from the Bible, most Protestants of the Reformation and post-Reformation era also refer to Rome as spiritual Babylon, the great enemy of God's people. Now, Jesus is the spiritual husband of the church. Therefore, if a church unites with or receives favors from one who is not her husband, she commits spiritual adultery. The kings of the earth represent civil powers. When churches lose the power of the gospel to transform hearts and lives, they turn to the power of the state. That's what the early Roman church did. I mean, when Paul was there, when the apostle Paul was there, it was a pure church. But as they became corrupted, instead of relying on the Holy Spirit and Yahshua for their might, they then began to rely on the fact that they were sitting in the capital of the world, which is Rome, and began to use Roman armies and soldiers and, and might and power and edicts and bulls to enforce its, its demands. So once a church turns to the state to support their doctrines, they commit spiritual fornication. When the Bible says that it sits on many waters, we know that that means countless people because in Revelation 17, 15, which we'll come to, she has deceived and made many drunk with her doctrines. This is a universal church. It's not a local church. It's not just the church downtown. It's the church that you will find, find in every corner of the globe. It is a universal church. Revelation 17, verse 3. Revelation 17, 3. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. And I saw a woman sit on a scarlet colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and 10 horns. Now, it's really important that this church is, is specified as, as a um, sitting upon a scarlet colored beast. So it's a color that's identified. When we get to Revelation 4, Revelation 17, 4, the Bible is going to talk some more about the color. It's going to talk about uh, purple and crimson, right? Purple and scarlet color. Let's talk about these colors. These colors are important because the Bible is giving you ways to identify this, this apostate church. Catholic cardinals frequently wear scarlet. Catholic priests wear red on Good Friday, Palm Sunday, Pentecost, and other special occasions. They wear purple on Advent, Lent, and at funerals. On some of these days, other colors are worn, including white, green, black, rose, and gold. But its primary colors are purple and scarlet. 
Riches are lavished on the icons of Catholicism, gold, pearls, precious stones, and pearls deck the statues of Mary and the saints in the Vatican. One of the ways that the, uh, the Bible identifies this woman is by her jewelry, by her jewelry, because the jewelry that she wore represented her pride. Instead of being clothed with righteousness, she wanted to be clothed with outward adornment. The rebuilding of St. Peter's Basilica in the 16th century involved the genius skill of Michelangelo, Bernini, Raphael, and other great artists of the day. The riches and treasures lavished on the stately buildings of the Roman Catholic Church are beyond description. Now, why are these colors important? Is there a historical reference to the colors? Yes, of course. And where do we find it? We find it in the book of Ezekiel, chapter 23, verses 14 to 16. And this is a, the background is, God is talking to Ezekiel, and he's telling Ezekiel what's wrong with the children of Israel. They are lusting after the Chaldeans, and then the Bible describes how they are dressed and the, the children of Israel wanted to commit prostitution, spiritual prostitution, that is, with these Chaldeans. They wanted to be like them. We find that in Ezekiel 23, verse 14, it reads, but she carried her prostitution. This is uh, children of Israel, spiritual prostitution, still further. She saw men portrayed on a wall, figures of Chaldeans portrayed in red, in the King James, it says vermilion, which is a deep, rich red color. Chaldeans is another name for Babylonians. Let's read Ezekiel 23, 15. The Bible has already described the color that they're wearing. Now they're going to give you more details. With belts around their waists and flowing turbans on their heads, all of them look like Babylonian chariot officers, natives of Chaldea, as soon as she saw them, she lusted after them and sent messengers to them in Chaldea. So even back then, during the days of Ezekiel, they wore the, the red and they wore the belt sashes and they wore the hats. The Pope is, is preceded in procession by the cardinals. The cardinals are resplendent in their red robes. Cardinals in the Roman Catholic Church are like princes in a kingdom. They make up what is known as the Sacred College of Cardinals. The cardinals form the Pope's council. This term, college, college of Cardinals, is a Babylonian term. It, it, this is the same college that existed with the Babylonian priest. The special sign of a cardinal is his hat. Although it is not very practical, it is seldom worn. For hundreds of years, it has been a wide-brimmed silk hat from which tassels hang on either side. More commonly, cardinals wear the familiar four-cornered red berettas and skull caps in the same color. Paul II, a Venetian-born pope who loved magnificence, first put the cardinals into red, a deep red, halfway between scarlet and crimson in 1464. So isn't it amazing when the Bible defines her and tells you how she looks and, and she defines herself and tells you how she looks? Revelation 17, 4 reads, And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. Now, the official clothing worn by the Pope on special occasions is richer in gold. Special occasion, he's pulling out the gold and the jewelry and more gold and jewelry than any earthly crown. The papal tiara on display in the Vatican Museum is valuable beyond comprehension. It's priceless. The papal tiara or triple crown is the papacy's reminder of the Pope's power is threefold. It means that he is Lord of heaven and earth and below the earth. The, the Pope says he has the keys to heaven and hell. So he's the ruler on earth, the temporal ruler over all the earthly kings. That's what the middle tier means. The upper tier means that he's got the key to kingdom meaning that if you pay the right fee, he can give you admission into heaven. And if you don't pay the fee or don't confess to an earthly pontiff or earthly priest, he has the right to send you to hell. The Supreme Pontiff's arms have featured a tiara since ancient times. His arms, his banner, his flag, 
at the beginning, this was a sort of closed toque, like a, a, a hat, like, a, like those hats that we wear when it's cold outside, the little wool hats, but it's changed. In 1130, a crown was added, a symbol of, Christ, of the church's sovereignty over the states, a crown to show kingship, kingship over the states, over the civilian authorities. Boniface VIII in 1301 added a second crown at the time of the confrontation with Philip the Fair, King of France. Uh, Philip the Fair of King of France is the one that Boniface VIII made stand in the cold, barefooted for four days while he decided whether or not he was going to forgive him of his sins. And to show that his spiritual authority was superior to any civic authority, so he added another crown to let the, the other kings know, I've got more crowns than you. I am higher than you. In Bible times, this was called a king of kings or a lord of lords, meaning a king who was over other kings. He's got three crowns to show that there is no king on earth that is above this king. It was Benedict the 12th in 1342 who added a third crown to symbolize the Pope's moral authority over all secular monarchs, right? So he's got the, the moral authority. That's the keys to heaven. Now, the Bible also talks about this woman has a golden cup in her hand, a golden cup. So the woman with the golden cup in her hand is a common symbol in Roman uh, Catholic sculptures and paintings. No other Christian denomination has depicted itself in such a manner. According to Revelation 17, the cup is full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication, which represents false doctrine that she has made all the nations of the world drink. The reformers, the Protestant reformers, exposed these misguided doctrines during the Reformation. But sadly, the Protestant churches of today are willing to set aside their doctrinal differences with Rome in order to achieve Christian unity that they call ecumenicism, meaning let's all come together. However, unity achieved through sacrificing truth, according to the Bible, will not last. Here's a list of some of the main doctrines challenged by the reformers and reconfirmed by Rome during the Council of Trent. One is called transubstantiation, justification by faith and works, the medieval mass, the seven sacraments, celibacy of the priests, purgatory, indulgences, papal authority to enforce decrees of the council and promised obedience to the Pope from the church officials. Also, they preach the veneration of Mary that has been upheld and in fact has increased. They treat Mary as if she is a God. She is holy and, and sinless. And the Bible says that all of us have sinned, every single one of us. There's only one person who came to the earth and was sinless and that was Yahshua. Transubstantiation is the claim that Jesus' physical body is offered every time the Mass is held. That's what the Christ Mass was about, the Christ Mass, the Christmas that, you, that people worship. Marvelously, marvelously, this is what the Pope says about transubstantiation. It says, marvelously, dignity of the priests in their hands as in the womb of the Blessed Virgin, Mary, the Son of God, becomes incarnate. Behold, the power of the priest, the tongue of the priest makes God from a morsel of bread. It is more than creating the world. They're saying that the priest, by his words, can turn a, a cracker into God's literal body, Yahshua's literal body. And then you eat him, right? And when you eat him, that is cannibalism. And it means that you're eating him over and over again. Canon 1 says, if anyone denies that in the sacrament of the most holy Eucharist, Eucharist are contained truly, really, and substantially the body and blood together with the soul and dignity of the Lord Jesus Christ and is consequently the whole Christ, but says that he is, he is only a sign or a figure or a force, let him be an, an, an anathema. I mean, let him be excommunicated. So if you say, like many churches do when they have communion, that this is just a symbol of Christ when he says, you know, eat my blood in my body. We don't literally think that we're drinking blood like a vampire or literally eating his body like a cannibal. The Bible, however, clearly says, by one sacrifice, he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That's Hebrews 10, 14. So he was sacrificed once. So this Catholic service, he's sacrificed every day, three, four, five times a day around the world, millions of times over. 
And if you look at the picture, those of you who are looking on the screen, this is the picture, the symbol of, of Fides. She is literally the goddess of the Catholic Church, Fides. It means fidelity. It means, means that you can trust what I say. And she is holding a golden cup here. It's a cup, and inside the cup is the sun, right? Citadel Vaticano. Right, so let's go on to verse five, Revelation 17, five. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots and Abominations of the Earth. The Bible gives you her name. Remember, he says, watch out for this beast, her number, her name, you know, and all of these things that he tells you to look out for. So here we get her name. The name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots, Abomination of the Earth. Now, Rome itself applies the term mystery to its own institution and teaching. Pope John Paul II referred to the mystery of the church. Mystery is also the term used by the Roman Catholic Church to refer to the mass or the transubstantiation of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. In the liturgy of the mass, the priest refers to the mystery of faith. The Catholic rosary is also associated with the mysteries of the faith. There are 15 dec decades of prayer, 150 recitations, and during each of these decades, one of these mysteries is recalled. The 15 mysteries of the rosary are divided into four groups, the joyful, the sorrowful, the luminous, and the glorious. Rome claims to be the mother of all the churches. At the entrance of St. John Lateran Cathedral in Rome, that is the most important church in all of Rome, there's a huge Latin inscription. I'm not gonna try to say it in Latin, but it is translated into the English that reads Sacred Lat Lateran Church, Church Mother and Head of All the Churches of the City and of the World. The Catechism of the Catholic Church calls the church the mother and teacher. The Dominus Aesis, the faith declaration says, it must be always clear that the one holy Catholic and apostolic universal church is not the sister, but the mother of all churches. So she is part of Babylon, the great city that, that Satan has set up in opposition to the new Jerusalem of God. The Roman Catholic Church has proudly styled herself the mother church, but here she is called the mother of harlots. From the mother have come the various Protestant denominations which profess to be clean and pure, vehemently rejecting the corruptions of the Catholic Church. But these churches have shown a distressing tendency to follow their mother's example of sacrificing truth and the approval of God to seek the power of the state and to enforce doctrine, and thus they choose to become harlots with their mother. Revelation 17, six says, Revelation 17, six, and it says, and I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, right? So this woman is drunken with blood. Whose blood is she drinking? Whose blood? She is truly drunk with the blood of the saints. History records the deeds of the papacy as it is used the state to persecute and kill millions of faithful Christians during the dark ages. The Catholic Church has disguised itself with humble apologies for these actions, but she has not changed. The same spirit of persecution will again be exhibited against God's faithful children who will not drink the wine of her corruption just before the second coming of Christ. You know, in the Bible, God says, I do not change. I change not. And the Catholic Church, one of its mottos is that it does not change. It is infallible. It does not make mistakes. So what it was yesterday, it will be today. And what it is today, it will be tomorrow. It will not change. Revelation 12, 7 says, I mean, sorry, Revelation 17, 7. Revelation 17, 7. And the angel said unto me, wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which has the seven heads and 10 horns. So again, the angel is gonna make it clear who this, this uh, woman is. Seven heads, 10 horns. Remember, we already went over the seven heads. The seven heads were Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, the Roman Empire, and then the revived Roman Empire. The angel is gonna break it down and tell you that five are, um, five, five were, one is, and one is yet to come. The angel is going to tell us that when we get to the next verse. Now, who are these 10 kings? Who are the 10 kings? We went over the 10 kings already. The 10 kings were the 10 divisions of the Roman Empire 
after Ro the fall of Rome in 476 AD. Anglo-Saxons, Franks, Alemanni, Burgundians, Suevi, Visigoths, Lombards, Ostrogoths, Heruli, and Vandals. Three of those 10 kings were destroyed. Ostrogoths, Heruli, and Vandals were all destroyed, and they were destroyed because they had a, a different understanding of, of the, the Godhead than the Catholic Church, than the Pope. So the Pope said they had to go, right? And so when he got rid of them, that's when the Pope had all the power that he needed in order to become um, the civil and spiritual authority over Western Rome. Let's go to Revelation 17, verse 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. So we talked about this before, this, this great time that this church ruled through 1,260 years. And at the end of the 1,260 years, um, Napoleon Bonaparte's general, Berthier, in 1798, dethroned the Pope. So that's why the Bible says she was, then she's not, but the Bible says she's coming back. And she did. It was reestablished in the 1920s and given its own kingdom called the Vatican, where it had civil and religious authority. Let's go to Revelation 17, 9. And here's the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which she sitteth. Well, what are these seven mountains? Bible's giving you clue after clue. Rome is known as the city of seven hills. The Vatican sits on one side of the Tiber River facing seven hills. In ancient times, hills were sacred places used to worship and offer sacrifices to deities. The systems of worship were based on salvation by works and also included a counterfeit savior or messiah as mediators of both sexes. The gods were then worshiped in these places were manifestations of the sun god who was an androgenic in that he or she could manifest him or herself in the male or female, male or female form. If you are looking at fashion today, the world has become androgenic. So men and women can wear the same haircut, they can wear the same clothes, they can wear the same shoes, they even got men wearing dresses nowadays. That is counter to what the Bible says in Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, Deuteronomy 22, verse 5, which says that men and women were supposed to look different. A man should not wear what pertained to a woman, and a woman wasn't supposed to wear what pertained to a man. God was trying to keep the sexes separate, but because the angels who are fallen are neither male nor female, these false gods that they worshiped are androgenic. They come as men, they come as women, the same God. Rome is also geographically features seven hills. These are the seven hills that literally sit in Rome. Esquiline, Palatine, Aventine, Capitoline, Curuline, Bimelin, and Catiline Hill. The most important hill was Capitoline Hill or Capitol Hill. And at Capitol Hill, there set a, a, a um, temple to their god Jupiter. Their god Jupiter, who later on was called uh, Zeus, right? So Zeus and Zup uh, Jupiter were the same. If you remember when we went over the seven churches, in Pergamos, Pergamos there was a statue of Zeus. And, and the Bible says that that is where Satan sits. So Zeus's seat was Satan's seat. Zeus was a, a different name for Satan. Satan used the name Zeus. And he placed that capital, his temple, on the Capitol Hill. If you look at downtown Washington, we have a capital, and it looks like the capital in Rome, and it is identical for all practical purposes. When they set up America, they chose the District of Columbia because it too sits on seven hills. And the most significant hill is Capitol Hill, where we have the Capitol building. I'll leave it at that. Times against us. The historic center of Rome was built on seven hills and has been more has been known since ancient times as the city of seven hills. The phrase seven mountains on which the woman sitteth also serves to link the woman with the city of Rome 
establishing her once again as the Roman Catholic Church. Revelation 17, 10. And there are seven kings, which five are fallen, and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is, even he is of the eighth, and is of the seventh, and going into perdition. Right? So the Bible is telling you how these, how these uh, kings are lining up. The kings are lining up. So we had the, the first five, right? The first five of these kings. And it says about the six is coming and he is of the seven, right? So he's part of the seven. Five of these powers, which have been noted in the books of Daniel and Revelation are Babylon, Media, Persia, Greece, Pagan Rome, and Papal Rome. At the end of time, this eighth power that's coming, the power of Papal Rome is greater than ever. Her deadly wound is healed and she again strongly persecutes God's people as in former years. The revived Roman Catholic Church unites with apostate Protestants and spiritists to form a religious political entity that is supported by the governments of the world. So that's the last power that we're waiting on. The Bible calls it uh, what it is, and we call it the New World Order. That would be the last one, where all of these kingdoms become one great kingdom, just like uh, Babylon, you know, when they built that tower to heaven. It will become one great world power. Revelation 17, 12, Revelation 17, verse 12. And it says, and the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings, which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Verse 13, these have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them. For he is the Lord of lords and the king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. Now, a lot of times when people see these 10 kings, they say, oh, these are different 10 kings. But if you look at the EU, the, the, the EU kingdoms, those are the same kingdoms. They, they haven't changed, they're still here. They're still here, they've changed their form. So these kingdoms will come together again to form this new one world order. Verse, verse um, 15, Revelation 17, verse 15. And he said unto me, these waters which thou sawest, where the horse sitteth, are peoples and multitudes, nations, and tongues. So again, the Bible is declaring that it sits on, over all the world. And the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So for some reason at the end of time, because when these plagues fall and, and the woman or this church is not able to prevent these plagues that are going to affect these kingdoms, it's going to affect their trade. Remember, it's going to affect their food. It's going to affect uh, what they drink, right? They're going to have sores all over their body. And this woman who says that she speaks for God is not going to be able to stop these, these torments that are coming on the world. If you remember from the book of Daniel, there was King Nebuchadnezzar. He had a dream in Daniel chapter uh, one and two. He has a dream and he calls his wise men to interpret the dream. And when the wise men could not interpret the dream, the king says he's going to destroy all of the, the priests. That was their function. They were supposed to be able to speak to the gods and speak for the gods. And when they weren't able to do their religious function that was going to protect him, he said, let's destroy them. The same will happen with this church. When these civil powers realized that all of the power that she had and said that she could speak for God was the vicar or representative of God, when she cannot stop these plagues, they will become angry and they will want exact uh, revenge out of her, all right? Revelation 17, 17, Revelation 17, 17. It says, for God has put into their hearts to fulfill his will, and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast, unto the words of God shall be fulfilled. God always has the last word. Elohim has the last word. Verse 18, Revelation 17, 18. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. So he tells at the end, this woman reigns over the kings of the earth. So there's a church that reigns over the kings of the earth. Every king, every, every prime minister, every anybody who has ever existed 
will bow and kiss the hands of these popes, and they do it already. We, you know, they call him um, uh, the father. They call, they call him, you know, Obama was in, and, and the pope came to town, they called him holy father. All of these presidents and prime ministers call him holy father. They're saying that you are the spiritual being that I come to, that I, that I submit to, right? So the 10 horns again, finally, are the, the nations of Europe and all the earth, and they rally under the banner of Rome. They are also called the 10 waters, called, not the 10 waters, but they are called the waters where the horse sitteth. And they that dwell upon the earth, whose names were not written in the book of life. So these nations, as they give over their power to her, the Bible says you got to choose a side, choose a side. And these nations will give the end time church state alliance, which is ba to Babylon the great. They will give all of their strength to make war against Yahshua the lamb and his, his people who keep God's commandments and have the faith of Jesus. So when he comes back, there's gonna be something called Armageddon. And these nations are gonna turn their missiles on the King of Kings. Can you imagine that turning a missile on Yahshua? Are they crazy? I mean, he's got more power than a little bit. So in closing, the nations of the world will support Babylon's Sunday law. It's coming. They will enforce her decree and those who disobey will not be allowed to buy or sell. Ultimately, they support legislation calling for the death of God's people. Yes, it's coming back, death decrees. However, when Yeshua delivers his faithful followers in Revelation 19 verses 11 to 20, the multitudes who have supported the great whore finally realize that they have been deceived and that they are eternally lost. In rage, they will turn upon the religious leaders. Thus, by God's will, the punishment of the harlot of Babylon is carried out in part by her own allies. When people wake up in the last days and find out that, that, that religious people have told them that they can trample over God's holy day, and didn't tell them the truth, they're gonna be angry. They're gonna be looking for these ministers who told them that they didn't have to care about it. It was nailed to the cross, it doesn't matter. And all of these things, they're gonna be angry. I'm gonna recommend strongly that all of us read the Bible for ourselves, all of us. God wants to speak to us in these last days. He wants to wake us up out of our spiritual stupor. He wants us to have eyes that we might see and ears that we may hear. Pray for me as I pray for you. Pray for me as I pray for you. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom. For what would it profit any one of us to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul? Uh, we're going to jump on the phone lines. If you want to call in for a few minutes, we'll be on for about five or 10 minutes. You're welcome to call in. Let me give you the number. The number is um 712-432-0075 the pin code is 745-954-POUND again the number 712-432-0075 and the code to dial in is 745-954-POUND we're almost done with with Daniel and Revelation we're in 17 now tomorrow's 18 19 20 21 22 we got five more days and then we may add that final day on so we can do a recap. But I do thank you for being on. I look forward to seeing each of you at the gates of the kingdom. What would it profit us to gain the whole world and to lose our own soul? Today's Bible study is officially over. Elohim bless.